blasting, billowing, bursting forth with the power of 10 billion butterfly sneezes. I'm Tom Bain, and this is Wine, Money, and Song. If you're interested in wines and wanting to find out the best values, please subscribe. On to episode three of Bordeaux Vintages. And at the end of this episode, we're going to give you the charts of the great vintages. Uh, and we'll give you the chart, what I consider to be the best value vintage. And as I said before, why money and songs about value. Uh, and you're going to have to pay up on those great vintages. But hopefully on those uh, undervalued vintages, you're going to get some great buys and really outstanding wines. So starting out with the and also I'll tell you the vintages that blow. Uh, it's like the song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Rain. You can even say it blows all of the uh, so on and so forth. Okay, starting off with the 2000. Uh, the 2000 vintage, when I tasted it at a barrel, uh, it seemed a synthesis of uh, 80, 86, 96 with the big tannins, but it had a good core of fruit. It had a very, very good core of fruit. And that's what differentiated it from those other vintages. Uh, and throughout all of Bordeaux, uh, they made big, big scale wines and wines that were very tannic, but they're still aging well. You can drink most of them now, but some of them will still age on. And it's an outstanding vintage. And we go on to 2001, there's some good wines. Uh, the Right Bank made some decent wines, but it's nothing of interest unless you can pick something up really cheap. 2002, uh, some of the wines were okay, uh, but a lot of the wines were lacking a middle, you know, really didn't have the stuffing. Then we come to 2003, and 2003 is a very controversial vintage in my opinion. Now, all the writers wrote them up and uh, said how wonderful they're going to be, they're mountains of wine, and they're, they're titans, they're this and that. In 2003, thousands of people died in France from the torrid heat. And it was a vintage at the time. It was the hottest and driest it was in France. And to me, the wines never had charm. Now, there's some outstanding wines there. But to me, every wine, almost every wine that I have at the end, it has that ro roti quality, roasted quality. And some of the wines are good, but they lack the charm and, and, and uh, the stuffing. And the wines are coarsely tannic. And I know people's, the wine writers refuse to lower their rating. So that's their opinion. That's my opinion. Then we hit 2004. And 2004 well, was a good uh, value vintage. All of the good chateaus, they made good wines. And if they were at good prices, you buy them. If you see them today, very good vintage. Then we hit 2005, and 2005 is a great vintage. Uh, it's a vintage uh, that's very age-worthy and, and, and uh, very tannic, very big. But the one thing about 2005, it was very good on both banks, and the right bank has a tendency of overblown and being uh, too extracted. 2005 is a really good vintage in the right bank. They got it right on the right bank. And on the left bank, bank classic vintage, uh, and wines are going to age a long time. They're aging slowly, but they're still monumental wines, in my opinion. And they're going to have a very, very long life. So then we go to 2006. And 2006 was in the shadow of 2005. And it was a very warm vintage. But they made some, some very good wines on the left bank. And you can pick them up at good prices. Excellent uh, uh, choice for uh, well-priced wines. And they're aging well. And if you see them in the market, you should, you should consider them. Uh, 2007 uh, really blows. It, 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 it was so bad that the company that I used to work for, Chateau and Estates, they didn't buy any. Now, the reason why they didn't buy any uh, 
is two or threefold. Uh, first of all, it was a bad vintage, and we had a large inventory of older vintages. But uh, Diageo had stepped in, who bought out from Seagram's, and they owned Chateau Estate at that time. They decided that they wanted to get out of the Bordeaux wine business. So that's what that signified. Uh, but the wines were not good. Uh, 2008 was another vintage like 2004, very good value. Uh, some of the wines are very good. There's very few great wines, but uh, you can find really good value in 2008 on, uh, on both banks, right and left bank. Uh, 2009 and 2010, I like to put together because they're both very highly received and... Uh, I'm going to go through the 2009s uh, when I did out of bottle tasting at the Union and Grand Cru. I was blown away by the quality of the 2009s. Now, it's not a classic year. There's very lush fruit, low acidity, uh, tremendous ripeness, and the wines were great out of the gate. Uh, but I went through the wines, and they were just delicious. And I knew they were going to age well too. They had good balance. Uh, could I say one, one bank was over the left? No, but you had to be very careful of the right bank that they were too over the top. And they were still making a lot of the Saint Emilion producers and a few Pomerol producers were over extracting, picking too late, uh, making very clumsy wines. But a lot of the press still liked that. But me, I never liked it. And I remember when I went to this tasting, the 2009s, I tasted. 300 point wines <clears throat> and I didn't like them. I didn't like them. they were too over extracted too alcoholic too dense and no charm and were they good wines yeah I guess maybe they were but they lacked charm and they lacked roundness and uh, uh, it's all subjective and it's a style of wine then we go to 2010 2010 was heralded as, as, as a great classic vintage that the wines were going to have to age and they weren't as flashy as the 2009s and, and they're in a different uh, time zone than the 2009s. I don't agree with that. Uh, the 2010s are even more alcoholic than the 2009s. I know Obreon was 14.3 alcohol, the largest alcohol it ever had at the time. Uh, and the 2010s made some outstanding wines, but they're tannic and, and alcoholic, and they come from a hot vintage. And a lot of these wines, I don't know if they're going to overcome those high alcohols. Now, I know still people think it's a great vintage. Uh, I have bought very few, <clears throat> and I wish I bought more 2009s because they have more charm to them. But... We'll know in five or ten years whether I was right that I'd like the 89s more than the 2010s. So then we'll go on to the 2011, 2012, and 2013s. Uh, two, the 2011 was okay for early drinking, uh, easygoing wines, nice made wines. Uh, 2012 was very good on the right bank. And if you have a chance and you see 2012s come up and you have a chance to buy them, the Santa Million of Pomerals, you can get some really good buys in that. The 2013s, uh, they were good, nothing outstanding. And all these wines are going to wash out because there's still inventory in Bordeaux and the prices will find their level that they'll sell. Then we got into 2014, uh, which were very good and useful vintage. Uh, on the left bank, the cabs were very good and balanced, uh, and, and you could pick up some good wines. Now we hit the 2015s and 16s, <coughs> two very, very good vintages, uh, maybe one great. The 2015s, when I had them out of bottle, uh, I liked the wines immensely. Uh, and, and, and it's from a very warm harvest. And uh, the vintage was very, very ripe. And, but uniformly on both banks, the wines were delicious and well put together. And I really didn't taste 
too many wines that were off. I was surprised how much I liked them. I, I wouldn't say that overall that it's a great vintage, but it's an excellent vintage. And there are a few great wines, obviously. But we and, and it was outstanding on the right bank uh, in 15, and, and, and Grob was outstanding too. But the right bank wines might be better than the 16 right bank wines, in my opinion, because they have more charm. Then we go to the 216. Uh, everyone is hailing it as true, truly classical uh, wines that are going to age. Uh, I felt they were a little spotty on the right bank, but whenever I've had these wines, uh, I can see their greatness in the future, but you're going to have to wait a long time for these wines. You're going to have to wait. I had some Lynch Bage recently, uh, some Mayne and a few others. You got, they've really went into a, 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 a turtle shell. They're, they're, they're hiding. And, and I have a feeling it's going to be five, maybe ten years for some of these wines to come out. Now, they could be truly classical and long-aged and well-made wines, but we're going to see down the road. But it's a classical vintage. Then we go to 2017. Frost uh, really affected, <coughs> excuse me, the early maturing. Um, you know, it made it early maturing uh, vintage, and the frost cut down on the crop. And and not very serious wines, but easy drinking wines. 2018, 19, and 20 uh, were uh, all three outstanding. Trio of back to back to back outstanding vintages. 18 is a very open style and lush, and the left bank wines are favored. Uh, while 2019, both banks, right bank and left bank, were excellent, smooth, and balanced, and they're not as big as the 18s. The 18s were more ripe. Uh, I think the 19s of the three vintages of 18, the 19, and 20 might be the best Bordeaux. Bordeaux vintage. Uh, the 2020 were pure, ripe, uh, very nice tannins, sensual and lush and big and ripe. And all three of those vintages throughout made outstanding wines. So you have a lot to pick from. Uh, following through on the 2021s, um, after the three outstanding vintages, uh, there were a lot of problems in 21. Uh, the only thing that didn't happen, you know, they had frost, uh, they had rain, they had mildew, uh, uh, hail. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't have locusts. You know? <laughs> All the things they went through. Uh, but the grapes struggled to ripen, and, and, and uh, it was a battleground, that, that vintage. And... Some of the wines are nice, and they're probably early drinking. So this is going to end with the 2022. Now, many people think the 2022 is going to be a great vintage. Now, it's still in barrel, uh, and, and the wines have incredible numbers. But it's a high alcohol year. It's an incredible drought year. And all of the wines at a barrel were very gen, you know, generous, very fruity, and they had decent acidity. <coughs> Excuse me. And what these wines are going to have to prove in aging is that are they going to age well, or is the high alcohol and are the uh, acids firm enough and going to stay with the wine or will they just drop out at the end and the press thinks it's great all the winemakers struggled because of the heat and drought record heat and drought but they changed the way they made the wine they used less small new barrels more neutral more concrete eggs they did whole cluster trying to help lower the alcohol and preserve the fruit of the wine uh, we have to follow this closely, but there is an opportunity for this to be something like the 2003 or a great vintage and maybe somewhere along the lines of 82 with the great fruit concentration. We shall see. Now, follow the tables at the end of this. 
lining up the great vintages, lining up the good value vintages, and the ones that you should definitely stay away from. Hopefully you found these helpful.